All right, good morning. Welcome to our service. It's a beautiful day outside. The psalmist says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And those of us that are able to be here and are here this morning, we will do just that. Uh, we have a number of folks out of town for a variety of reasons. Uh, there's a few that are sick as well, uh, but some have returned to us right down here. On the front row, Stuart Nisi. It's been a while since we've been able to have him here, them here. Uh, but God has answered prayer, and they're able to be back with us. So we uh, welcome you guys back. If this is your first time with us, a special welcome to you. or first time in a while. We're so glad to have you with us today. Uh, I want to say thank you to all who came yesterday and worked at our fall work day. We got a lot done, both inside and out. Uh, you see some of the fruit of that labor out there on that island over there that's been needing attention for a while, and we were able to do that yesterday. Uh, there's some other things that we got done inside that uh, have been needing to get done as well. And so to all who came and worked yesterday, uh, you laid up treasure in heaven that can't be taken away. And uh, so I say thank you to all of you who participated in that. Uh, you'll see in your bulletin there are a couple of resources that we remind you of from time to time. This discipleship resource called Right Now Media, there is a QR code in there that you can scan that takes you to a link where you can set up an account uh, through our church. It's provided through our church. You don't have to be a member here of our church to participate or to take advantage of this. It's over 20,000 video. It's a resource library, 20,000 Bible study videos on all kinds of topics. They're by all ages and stages of life. Uh, so that is a powerful resource that I hope you will take advantage of and utilize. Uh, you can even share that with others. Um, we use it in different settings here in our ministry and encourage our families to use it as well. So there's information in there about that. If you have any questions, see uh, myself or Dina. We can help you get that going. And then also, for those who have been attending here or are members, uh, we have a lot of new folks recently, and we're trying to get our, our directory updated. It's a way that you can help learn who is who. And that information is in there as well. There's another QR code for how you can go set up uh, an account then you can download the Instant Church Directory app onto your phone or your smart device, and that way you can have it to touch your fingers. You can look up people and, and learn names and faces. It'll be very, very helpful. If you have any struggles with that, let us know as well. You see a few other dates looking ahead. want to uh, keep those in mind, but uh, we're here to worship Christ this morning. He is our reason for being here, and our theme this morning is His sovereign plan. You see the verse in front of you, the Lord reigns. That speaks of his rulership, his sovereign rulership over all, even the bad and the ugly, even the frustrating, painful times, he is accomplishing his purpose. And because he's reigning, our response is to rejoice. That's what the psalmist says. Because he reigns, let us rejoice. And that's exactly what we're going to do together this morning. So let's stand and begin our time of rejoicing and praising the Lord together with an old hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns. He rules and reigns. He is the Lord.
question is, is he adored in your life this morning? Amen. One of you, he is adored. <laughs> no, I... You know, it's, it's, it's something that we have to make the choice every single day, isn't it? We have to choose that we're going to focus on him. We have to choose to look at who he is and what he has done. And when we get our focus on him, that adoration will naturally flow. Uh, he's to be magnified. That's not us making him bigger because we can't make him bigger. But we want to show people how big he is. We want to live our lives in the reality that he is great and that he is big. And so this morning we're gathered together to remind each other, to sing to each other psalms, hymns, spiritual songs that remind us of how great and how sovereign our God is. Let's open up this morning with a word of prayer. Father, we are so grateful to be here. The beauty of your creation outside to be able to gather with brothers and sisters in Christ and to sing praises of you, to be reminded of how great you are, that you alone are in control. You alone are the sovereign one. You're the only one who deserves to be worshipped and praised. And this morning, that is the desire of each heart here today. And Father, I pray that as we are reminded of these truths, our hearts would be encouraged. Our hearts would know peace and rest and contentment as we trust in you and father we pray that if there's anybody here today that does not have a relationship with you through the lord jesus christ that today would be the day that your spirit draws them to saving faith we look forward to what you're going to do we pray this all in the name of jesus amen thank you, you may be seated our scripture reading is psalms 146 and as we focus on god's control his sovereignty his his sovereign will and plan when we know that he is in control, we can give praise. So where the text is as it is on the screen, we'll read that together. When it goes to the smaller text, the normal font, I will read that. Psalms 146, beginning in verse number one, read it with me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes. And a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow, the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations, praise the Lord. And again, I've already said it, but one of the reasons we gather together is we need to be reminded that God's in control. We need to be reminded that every aspect of our lives, the good and the bad, he's still in charge, he's still good, and he's still working. Let's stand together as we sing the reality that we're just created finite beings. He's forever. Be unto your name.
praises, honor, and glory. And the reality is, as much as we try, we can't do it justice, can we? But he knows our heart and he loves to hear the praise from our hearts. That was my fault at the beginning. It wasn't PowerPoint. It wasn't any of these people. I started, tried to start us too early. That was my bad. I'm reminded that I'm just a vapor. I'm finite. <laughs> Christ, our hope and life and death. Things good happen, things bad happen. No matter what we go through, the hope doesn't change. The hope is always only the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's sing it out. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? Good job. Thank you. you. May be seated. He is our hope. Let's look to the Lord in prayer as we come now to his word. 
Father, our theme this morning has been trusting in, hoping in, resting in your sovereign control over all things. <clears throat> you rule and reign, and so we are to rejoice. And that's what we have sought to do this morning through these songs we have sung, acknowledging that Jesus Christ is king and giving him the glory and adoration that is due him, crowning him with many crowns, the Lamb who was slain, yet rose again for our resurrection, for our justification, for our salvation. And he is seated on your right hand. His work accomplished, and he intercedes for us. And the praise and the glory and honor is due to him and to his name alone. That is the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. He is our only hope. Whether in life or in death, the struggles, the challenges, the hardships of life, he alone is our hope. That's what we have lifted in praise to you this morning. That's what we've listed in truth, in worship. It's how we are exhorting each other to acknowledge these truths, to surrender to these truths, and to be encouraged by these truths. And that's why you call us to gather regularly together as you do. And so we have that great privilege today. We think today for our country, we think for uh, unborn babies all across the land right now and the fight for them to be able to live uh, where our country has many pockets of people that think that life in the womb is of no value and that the mother ought to be able to determine what to do with them. And that is a separate life and that life is granted by you, our creator, that life bears your image and thus it is sacred and it must be preserved and protected every life is precious no matter what stage it is in and so we must do our part to encourage mothers to to not cave to the common culture today and to let that baby be born if they can't handle it they can there are plenty of people who would love to take that baby Life is sacred. It is precious. You alone give life, and you alone determine when life is to be taken, when life ends here on this earth. And may our country recognize that. But to do that, it means they have to live by your truth. They have to accept what you say is true, and many don't want to accept that reality. Because if that's true, then that means they will give an account one day before you, and that's something many people are afraid of and don't want to do. But we are reminded of the truth, that truth is truth, and denial of the truth doesn't change the truth. And it's our uh, responsibility to hear the truth and submit to the truth. And that's why we come to your word now, to hear it, to see it for what it is. And we need the help of your spirit to open our eyes to it and help us to submit to it. We ask that you would help us to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Esther chapter 6, I invite you to turn with me there, Esther chapter 6, if you don't have your own copy of the scriptures. There's a, a black Bible in, the, in a seat in the front near you. Uh, I would encourage you to open this up. It'll be a little bit before halfway through uh, the Bible there, the book of Esther. And we are in chapter 6. We've been working our way through the book of Esther, verse by verse. And today we come to chapter 6, and God willing, we're going to accomplish something that, that today that does not happen very often, if ever. And that is we're going to make it through an entire chapter God willing, that's the plan. Uh, that's because the events of this chapter are all really one event that all flow together. So we're going to try. Perhaps you've heard someone say, maybe you even said yourself or at least thought, I wish I could have lived during the time when Jesus was alive here on earth. I wish I could have seen those powerful miracles. I wish I could have heard his authoritative teaching. Because if I could have seen that power firsthand with my own eyes, if I could have heard his teaching with my own ears, I would have a lot easier time believing that he could do, he could handle, he could work through the hard and difficult, the bad things in my life. Don't raise your hand. How many have thought that? Maybe even said that or at least heard someone else say that. Well, I'm not here to burst your bubble per se, but the reality is that's not actually a true thought or statement. You say, John, why? Because the vast majority of people who did hear Jesus, who did see the miracles he did, were not persuaded to bow and surrender to him. So would you have been any different? Even so, 
that's still where our human minds and hearts want to go. If I could just see him do some incredible miracle with my own eyes, something powerful, something extraordinary for me in my situation, I would trust him implicitly and I would obey him. You see, we're often guilty of looking for the big intervention. You know, like Jesus healing the people who were brought to him who were sick. Even raising some people from the dead, bringing them back to life. The big intervention. We're looking for the dramatic rescue like the Israelites experienced at the Red Sea. They were trapped with the Red Sea in front of them. Pharaoh's army was bearing in behind them to enslave them or kill them. And God miraculously parted the waters of the Red Sea, and they had a way of deliverance through the sea. And as they walked through, got to the other side, Pharaoh's army came rushing through, and God closed the waters back up and drowned all of Pharaoh's, drowned the enemy. We're looking for that dramatic rescue or the disciples in the boat in the storm, and Jesus comes to them on the water in one occasion and calms the storm. On another occasion, he's sleeping in the boat with them, and the storm comes, and they wake him up, and he stops the storm just by speaking the word. Dramatic rescue. We're looking for that. We're looking for his provision where there seems to be no other way God told Israel they were going to get the promised land. They're standing there. It's just on the other side of the Jordan River, but how in the world are they going to get across? There's no ferries. There's no boats. Not enough for a million plus people. And so he parts the water again, grants them access to the land he had promised them. Tremendous provision when there seems to be no other way. The awesome display of his power in the ten plagues in Egypt, and on and on we could describe these incredible displays of power, these things that we find ourselves longing for, wishing that we could experience so that we could know God is at work in our life. We get so enamored with these, we can. The tendency is there, the temptation is there to get so enamored with these big things that if we're not careful, we can tend to think that that's the only way God works. But the reality That is far more often than not that God chooses to work through providence in the ordinary. Providence in the ordinary. What do I mean by that? It's usually in the everyday, simple, ordinary, seemingly insignificant, at least by themselves they seem insignificant, decisions and circumstances of life every day that God chooses to work by and large. It's usually not in the big, powerful, dramatic interventions that God accomplishes his purpose. That's not to say that he doesn't. That's not to say that he can't. He can and he does. I just mentioned a number of them, and he still does that today in certain cases. But those are the exception. They're not the norm. Far more often, he chooses to work through the ordinary workings of our daily life. The daily decisions that you and I make moment by moment throughout the day, the circumstances that we find ourselves in day after day, that's how God chooses to work, by and large. And our text today makes this abundantly clear. So let's look in Esther chapter 6, verse 1. We're going to read the chapter. On that night, the king could not sleep. He gave orders to bring the book of the memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Big Thana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold. They were the last uh, guard before going into the king's personal quarters. They were the, the firewall. They, they, they guarded the threshold, and yet they sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, what honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. The king said, who's in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's young men told him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king said to him, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? Haman said to himself, well, who would the king delight to honor more than me? 
And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set, and let the robes and the horse be handed over to the one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. The king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes, the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. Now, obviously, the king didn't act that way, but that's how Mordecai is hearing it, or Haman's hearing it. We'll get to that in a minute. So Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai, led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. And Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning with his head covered. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him but will surely fall before him. While they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. This is an incredible passage. You don't see any big miracles. You don't see any extraordinary feats done by anyone, even by God here. Nothing miraculous but providence is most certainly at work in at least three ways. And I want us to note those this morning. I want you to notice, first of all, that God rules over and works through the smallest of details. God rules over and works through the smallest of details. Notice the ordinary, seemingly insignificant things that take place in these first few verses, the first one is that the king can't sleep. And many of you would say, that's very ordinary. That's very normal, right? <laughs> the king can't sleep. Why can't the king sleep? We read, we read in other books here in the Old Testament of other Babylonian and Persian kings who couldn't sleep. Remember in Daniel chapter 2, verse 1, the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, his sleep left him because he was troubled by dreams through which God was trying to get his attention. And so Nebuchadnezzar couldn't sleep. Unfortunately, he didn't respond to what God told him. And he had to learn the hard way, but he did learn. We read later in Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 6, a different king. This is the Medo-Persian king, Darius. It says we're told in verse 18 of chapter 6 that Darius's sleep fled from him because he had just been forced to throw one of his good friends and most trusted advisors Daniel into the lion's den. Why did he throw Daniel in the lion's den? Because his quote-unquote wise men, his advisors tricked him into signing an edict that you could only pray to the king, you couldn't pray to anyone else. And they did this because they knew that was the only way to trap Daniel who they hated because they knew Daniel prayed to his god and he wouldn't stop praying to his god. And so the king had to throw Daniel in for violating that law, even though he didn't want to do it. And so he couldn't sleep that night. And now, here we come to King Ahasuerus, known in history as King Xerxes. He doesn't have anything like that going on. He doesn't have special dreams going on where God's trying to get his attention. He hasn't just thrown a trusted advisor and friend into a den of lions. Who knows? Maybe he had a reflux that night. And his reflux kept him awake. Maybe he'd just done a workout or played a basketball game late at night and his heart rate and adrenaline was still going and he had trouble winding down. Who knows what it was? We don't know. Whatever human or physical reason might have been going on, there's no indication here. Maybe nothing other than he couldn't sleep. You've experienced that. I've experienced that. But from the perspective of providence... 
there was a very important reason that the king couldn't sleep. And notice what the text says, on that night. Don't miss those three words. On that night, because had it happened the next night, or the next night, or the night after that, it wouldn't have mattered because Mordecai would have been dead. It had to happen that night, or Mordecai would be dead the next day. And that's what it got, exactly what God did in his providence. On that night, the king couldn't sleep. There's a second aspect in these ordinary events that unfolds. When he can't sleep, what does he do? He gave order to bring the books of the memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. He chose to have the history books of the kingdom read. Think about all the things he could have done when he can't fall asleep. He could have got up and played ping pong. He could have shot pool. He could have gone in for a swim. He could have binge watched his favorite show. He could have popped in his AirPods and listened to his favorite podcast or audio book. He doesn't do any of those things. No, he says, read to me the books of the kingdom, the history books of the kingdom. Now, maybe he chose to do that because he thought the droning on of history would put him to sleep. I'm sure many of you would agree with that. Providence ruled over this simple, ordinary choice of all the things. He's got a harem full of hundreds of women. He could have pulled any or several of those in. But he chose to have the history books read to him. Providence ruled over this simple, ordinary choice to have the history books read. And there's a third aspect to providence in this. The particular book or scroll, probably in this case, that the attendant, the personal attendant of the king chose to read, just happened to contain the account of Mordecai the Jew exposing the plot five years ago by two of the king's closest, most trusted bodyguards to assassinate the king. That happened five years ago, and that's the very portion that they begin to read or they read from. That is not coincidence, my friend. That is providence at work in the smallest of details. So the king hears again, he hasn't heard or probably even thought of this in five years, he hears again the details of the plot that could have ended his life, and he asks a very valid but a very ordinary, natural response, question, what was done for this Mordecai to honor him for this? What was done? Verse 3, the king's men who attended him said, nothing. <laughs> I would think you would have done something, king, because that's what you normally do, but there's nothing recorded in here that you did anything for him. And Persian kings were known for, in fact, they took great pride in the fact that they were very magnanimous to people who benefited them in the kingdom. They were very generous and honored them in, in big ways, grand things to honor them, to express gratitude for ways they benefited them in the kingdom. And Xerxes had failed to do so. He must have been mortified. He must have been so embarrassed. You mean we didn't do anything for the guy who saved my life? But here's what we need to remember. Providence hadn't forgotten. God had not overlooked what Mordecai had done five years earlier. And now, the most crucial time of all, because remember, Mordecai is about to be put to death the very next day, according to Haman's plan anyway. At the most crucial time of all, God providentially works through all of these what on the surface seem to be ordinary, regular decisions. This would be a very natural thing that could have unfolded in any one of our lives if we were in this position. And he does so to bring Mordecai to the king's attention and give the king the desire to honor Mordecai in a very public and grand way. The psalmist says in Psalm 18, verse 30, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord 
proves true. He is a shield to all those who take refuge in him. And these first few verses in Esther chapter 6, really the whole chapter, is exhibit A for this verse, God's way is perfect. God never gets in a hurry because his way and his timing are always perfect. Up until this point, Esther and Mordecai have taken certain steps. We've read them, chapters 4, chapters 5, up to this point. They've taken certain steps, and they will continue to as God works through them. But at this part of the story, in chapter 6, what are Esther and Mordecai doing? They're sleeping, like most normal people. They're not doing a blessed thing. In fact, they're totally clueless to what Haman proposes to do tomorrow morning. They have no idea that as far as Haman's concerned, Mordecai is as good as dead. He's going to be up on gallows 75 feet tall by this time tomorrow. They're clueless. They're sleeping. And yet God is at work to preserve Mordecai through ordinary daily events and circumstances. God is at work to do what they cannot do. Friends, let this truth encourage you. God is working in ways you don't see, in ways you can't understand. He's working at times, yes, when you are asleep. And he's working through circumstances that you cannot change to accomplish his purposes in you. And that's for your good, and that's for his glory. And he often does this through the ordinary choices of everyday life. So what do you do? You just keep doing the right next thing. The next right thing, the next good thing that you're supposed to do, keep putting one foot in front of the other, obeying Jesus one moment by moment by moment. And watch God work. Do this in humble dependence on him to accomplish his purpose in your life. And remember this, every good deed will ultimately be rewarded. Mordecai, it's taken five years. He's, he's not even thinking about it anymore. Not that he's forgotten what he did, but as far as getting any type of recognition from the king, which no doubt he had seen over and over again as the king recognized others, why didn't it come to him? He didn't know why. Every good deed will ultimately be rewarded, but also know that no evil deed will ultimately go unpunished. No evil deed will ultimately go unpunished. You might jot down here Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Jesus said, and when he separates the goats from the sheep, the sheep representing those who belong to him, the goats who don't, rep- who don't, who don't belong to him, and they get sent into their appropriate eternities. He says to the sheep, you took care of me. You fed me. You clothed me. You gave me something to drink. And they said, when did we do all that? He said, when you've done it for the least of these, my children, you've done it to me. And then to the goats, he said, you you didn't visit me. You didn't take care of me. You didn't provide for me. When did we not see you and and not help you? He's like, when you didn't do it to those who belong to me, to others. A reminder that no good deed will ultimately be left out unrewarded. And at the same time, no evil deed will ultimately go unpunished. God rules over and works through the smallest of details. There's a second reality, a second principle of providence here. In chapter 6, God always accomplishes his purpose, and I love this. He often does so through the people whose only objective is their own purpose. Let that sink in. God's always going to accomplish his purpose, But he often chooses to do it through people whose only objective is their own purpose. That's exactly what we see here in this next portion. In this chapter of the book, we start to see the tide turn. We start to see that momentum is shifting from the enemy of God's people, Haman mostly, To the people of God, the momentum is starting to shift to their side. But get this, this has been the unmistakable plan of God all along. God didn't have to change gears all of a sudden. He didn't have to go to plan B when Haman concocted this evil plan against the Jews to annihilate all the Jews. Nor when he came up with this brand new plan just yesterday 
to knock off Mordecai way earlier because he couldn't stand Mordecai any further. He's had his fill of him. God's not having to shift it into another gear. He's not having to put it in overdrive. He's not having to take a different route because of what, Mordecai, or because of what Haman has, has plotted to do. But again, notice how it unfolds. It unfolds in ordinary, otherwise completely natural events. Haman shows up very, very early. It's still dark. It's in the early hours of the morning, well before the court would open, well before they would be there to conduct any official business. What time of night it is, we can't be sure, but we do know that it's still in the hours when most normal people are sleeping because the king's still having the history books read to him and his lack of sleep. Haman wants to be the first on the agenda of the royal business for the day. He wants to get to the king before anyone else or anything else has the opportunity to occupy the king's attention. And the king, for all his power and his prestige and his pride, he can't so, make as make one, he can't so much as make one decision by himself. Here he finds out he has failed miserably to reward Mordecai for this grand deed that he had done. And now he knows, I need to do something for this guy. And he can't just say, you know what? This is what I'm going to do. No. What does he say? Hey, who's in the court? Verse 4. And this, he's asking because he's no, he knows it's not likely anybody's going to be out there. It's way too early for somebody to be out there. Is there a chance somebody's out there in the court that can help me make a decision? Well, actually, matter of fact, King Haman's out there in the court. He's just come in. Of course, what's on Haman's mind, of course, nobody there knows it, but what's on Haman's mind is he wants to get the king's permission to kill Mordecai tomorrow, or today, the new day. He's been up all night. You see, Haman can't sleep either. Haman's been up all night building the gallows, or at least overseeing the construction of the gallows, and that, maybe that's why the king couldn't sleep. Maybe he heard the construction of the gallows. He didn't know what was going on. And now it's built, and now he needs the king's approval. for his. So he shows up in the court in the middle of the night, the wee hours of the morning, to get this approval. So Haman's brought in, and notice how the king words the question. Verse 6, Haman came in, the king said to him, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? A seemingly innocent question, a very natural question. But providence is ruling even the wording of the question. Haman doesn't come in and the king says, Oh, Haman, good, I'm, I'm really glad you're here because I got this predicament. I couldn't sleep, so I had him reading the history books to me, and I realized that five years ago, Mordecai the Jew uncovered this plot that was the, these, my guards were supposed to assassinate me. And Mordecai heard about it, and he told the queen, and the queen told me, and I didn't do anything to honor him. What should I do? He didn't ask it like that. Haman would have had a markedly different answer on what should be done to honor the king. Send him an extra box of corn dogs or something, king. <laughs> no, providence rules over even the simple question. What should be done for the man in whom the king delights? He doesn't mention Mordecai's name, and that's huge. <laughs> and Haman's response Haman said to himself, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? Man, if this guy's not full of himself. There couldn't be possibly one single person in the entire kingdom who the king delights in more than me. Not a chance. This guy is so full of himself. Now, to cut him just a tiny bit of slack, and I say mean the smallest bit of slack because we really shouldn't cut him much any at all. To be fair, he's just been promoted to the king's prime minister. Everything's going his way, and he's gotten this special invite to, to a feast with the king and the queen, just the three of them, not once, but twice, yesterday, and he's going for another one today. So who could possibly top that? Who could the king delight in more than me? The details with which Haman immediately answers suggest 
He's been daydreaming about an opportunity like this. This has been on his mind. He, he doesn't miss a beat. Well, king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought with the king is worn and the horse that the king has ridden on whose crown, head the royal crown is set. Let the robes be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the king, address the man whom the king delights to honor. Let him lead him on a horse through the square, proclaiming, This shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Remember, we talked last week about the, the idol of his ego. I mean, it's on full display here. He wanted to be seen as a king in public. That's how he wanted people to view him and get all the praise and accolades that royalty would get. <laughs> he, he must have been about to come out of his sandals as he spoke to the king, imagining all of this stuff about to happen to him. In short order... He's probably still imagining, let the robes be handed, the, ro the robes and the horse be handed, the one, it shall be done. And he probably, he probably still imagining on what else to add to it, but the king jumps in in verse 10. Hurry, take the robes. And my, by the way, remember, Haman's been on a hurry since yesterday evening. Hurry to build the gallows. Once that's done, hurry into the king's court to get the king's approval. Hurry into the king. Hurry to give an answer to the king. And the king says, hurry. Take the robes, the horse, just as you said, and do so <laughs> to Mordecai the Jew. Man, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall in there when the king said that. Haman has to feel like he has just been gut punched with a sledgehammer. As you think about, or as I think about, jaw-dropping moments in the Bible, this has to be number two to me. Number two, and it's certainly the funniest. The, the, the first one, number one, is, is not funny at all. It's very sobering. Matthew 7, 21 and 23, where Jesus says, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, I did all these things in your name, and I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That is the biggest draw drop. People who thought they belonged to Jesus and would spend eternity with him and in fact do not and will not. And that is sobering. But this has to be the second greatest. And it's funny, and I can't hardly read this passage without thinking of this picture. <laughs> I'm sure it looks something like that. You've got to be kidding me. The king says, take everything you've said. Do everything you've said. Don't leave out a single thing. And do it for Mordecai. Again, we see providence at work. Both the king and Haman have Mordecai on their mind that night, but for totally different reasons with totally different outcomes. Is it not interesting that the king has signed an edict that all the Jews are to be annihilated in short order, and now he is going to publicly honor in the grandest of ways a Jew? I think this suggests that the king still doesn't know who the people group is that's being put to death. Can you imagine what people in the town square think as they see Mordecai being led through the procession? The king said all the Jews are supposed to be killed, and here's one Jew that he's making a huge deal out of. What's going on here? Verse 11. So Haman took the robes and the horse and dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city. Proclaiming before them, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Again, to be a fly on the wall when Haman is dressing Mordecai. Do you think there was much interaction between the two? And when, Mor when <laughs> Mordecai is on this horse and Haman's walking him through, can you just imagine Haman? What's going through his mind? 
I love how one commentator put it, no writer, however gifted, could adequately describe the chagrin and mortification Haman must ex have experienced as he robed Mordecai and led him through the streets. Words fail us <laughs> to try to imagine or explain what Haman is feeling as he does this. I wonder what Mordecai is thinking. There's still that family feud there, remember. Was he tempted? Hey, Haman, been a little while. We're around different people. Been a little while since you said that thing about what the king delights, who the king delights, honors. Go ahead and shout it out, buddy. Haven't heard it in a little bit. I kind of like it. I don't know. Maybe he didn't. But can you imagine what's going through the minds of these two guys? The words that Haman <laughs> did utter had to be like gravel in his mouth. They were, after all, his own egotistical, selfish words that he had told the king to use that morning. His own selfish ambitions had come to back to bite him in a most unimaginable way. But again, this is not God's plan B. Graham Goldsworthy in his book, Gospel-Centered Hermeneutics, says this, History is not the story of God's trial of something good that failed, thus requiring him to come up with an emergency package as an afterthought. God's ultimate cre creation plan was not Adam and Eve in Eden, but Christ in the gospel. Folks, this is not God's plan B for Mordecai because of what Haman had attempted to do. And so my encouragement to you, my challenge, my exhortation to you is to trust God as he works in your life, in your situations, in your circumstances. He is not scrambling around for plan B in your life because of unfortunate things that have happened, physical sickness, illness, or, or wrongs done to you by other people, he's not scrambling around. Know that as God is working, and he often works through the selfish, egotistical people to accomplish his purpose. This is exactly what Peter said in, at Pentecost in Acts 2. This Jesus whom you guys have crucified he did this, that y'all did this according to his foreordained knowledge and will. That was God's plan all along, that selfish, egotistical people would be the human agents to put Jesus to death to accomplish our salvation. But let the reader beware. Be careful about what you wish on others and why you wish it, because God is fully capable of bringing it back on you, as Haman found out very very unmistakably. Third principle of providence from this chapter, God's purposes, while not always, are sometimes visible to those who are willing to see them. God's purposes, while not always, are sometimes visible to those who are willing to see them. Haman began the day extra early, with great anticipation of this perhaps being the biggest day of his life. Getting rid of his hated personal enemy in spectacular fashion that would serve as notice to anybody who dared resist him or disrespect him by hanging him, impaling him 75 feet high on gallows where everyone would see. Mordecai's Hanging would also serve as some sort of precursor to what was still months away, and that was the annihilation of the Jews, which was Haman's plan, going back to the family feud of a thousand years or more, as we've already seen in this study. And then, to top off the day, he was going to get to go to a second private feast with the king and queen. You couldn't ask for a better day if you could draw it up yourself if you're Haman. But in an instant, the spectacular day that he anticipated became Haman's terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Okay. 
It turned out to be a series of unfortunate events. If you've never seen that series, don't waste your time. <laughs> and it gets worse. <laughs> he goes home, verse 12. Mordecai returned to the king's gate, which that's an interesting phrase in and of itself. See, remember what Haman did after he had this special exaltation and dinner with the king and queen? He went out and got his friends all together and his wife and family and told them all about it. What does Mordecai do? He just returns to the gate, goes back to business, does his work. He didn't go pull people together and brag about what he's done. Nothing's really changed for Mordecai. He didn't get promoted. He didn't get a pay increase. He just got a nice parade. Yeah, really nice. He got recognized among the citizens. But guess what? He still got a death sentence over his head along with all the Jews months away. Nothing's changed for him. Yet you wonder as Mordecai goes back to the gate if he's not thinking if maybe this is the beginning of a turning of events. How providence is going to rescue us. There's going to be a swing in momentum. Maybe he's thinking this. Providence is on our side, will prevail. Maybe, we don't know, but guess who does start to understand that? Haman's wife and his friends. Haman goes back to his house, mourning with his head covered. This is like the, this is like the prominent people when they get arrested and the TV cameras are there and they got something over their face to hide their shame and their embarrassment or they're coming out of the courthouse after just having been uh, found guilty. And they try to hide their face, shield their face. Sometimes their attorneys will do it for them or their family members are there trying to... They're hiding their face in shame and mourning. And he gets home. And again, like yesterday, he needs to have his ego boosted. His fragile ego has been shattered again, even worse today than yesterday. Yesterday, it was just because Mordecai the Jew wouldn't stand up and acknowledge him. Today, all of this is unfolded. And he needs to have his fragile ego built up again and pumped up and encouraged. But he doesn't get it. In fact, just the opposite happens. His wise men and his wife said to him, If Mordecai, before you have begun to fall, Haman, you're falling to Mordecai. It's not the other way around. And if he's of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but you will surely fall before him. This is a totally different tune than what they say. It was their idea yesterday that he construct the gallows and hang Mordecai. Because of his hatred for him. Whether they just missed the point yesterday, because Haman did say in chapter 5, it's Mordecai the Jew. As long as he's alive, this means nothing to me. All this accolades and glory means nothing to me. Whether they just missed it, the point that Mordecai's a Jew, or they thought, well, we'll just try it and see what happens. Today, because of how the events have unfolded, it has become unmistakably clear to them that God's people will prevail. They don't know the one true God, but boy, they've heard about the God of Israel. All the surrounding nations had. They knew how God protected his people. They now know, after the way the events have unfolded, Haman, you're fighting a losing battle. Today is just the beginning of your downfall, and it is certain. You see, Haman's wife and his friends could see the writing on the wall. But there's no indication that Haman sees it or agrees. For one brief moment right here, Haman has the opportunity to fall on his face before God and repent of his sin of hatred and idolatry and ego and arrogance. For one brief moment. But he refuses to bow before his maker. In fact, while all this is, he's processing all of this, while they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. He's processing all this. The royal limousine pulls up and whisks Haman away to the second feast, but he's in far too much inner turmoil to enjoy and gloat over this occasion. The Pharisees... The chief priests, the religious leaders of Jesus' day refused to see the purposes of God in Christ. 
in spite of all the powerful things that Jesus did. And my question to you this morning is, are you willing to look and see what God is up to in your life? Or are you too tunnel visioned on yourself, on your agenda, your feelings, your desires, your circumstances, that you're missing what God is trying to accomplish in your life? Will you bow before God and his purposes? Haman refused to bow. Here was his chance, and he refused. Will you bow before God? Will you trust him to work in the ordinary moments, the ordinary choices of your life? Let's summarize it this way. God's purposes from eternity past... They were settled before he created the world. His purposes are being worked out through and even in spite of the selfish, sinful choices of ordinary people in everyday life. They were determined by him in eternity past, and he chooses to work them out oftentimes through and in spite of selfish, sinful choices of ordinary people in everyday life. Yes, he will at times do something supernatural. But most of the time, he works through the daily ordinary choices that we make. That's why the daily ordinary choices are so important. That's where we live every day. So ask yourself, have I lost sight of God's purposes in my life in the ordinary choices that I make in my daily activities. I'm so busy looking for him to do the next big thing that will wow me and wow everybody. I'm waiting for him to do the impossible. And so I'm sitting back waiting for him to do it instead of doing the next right thing. And have I failed to recognize that's why the ordinary choices and daily activities that I choose to do are so important because that's how God chooses to accomplish his work. It's not up to me and my agenda to do whatever I want. God has ordained that I live in obedience to him moment by moment, day by day, and thus he will accomplish his purposes. That's how he's chosen to work. That's his plan. That's why they're so important. Have you lost sight of that? thinking, well, this isn't a big moment. This isn't a big decision, so I can do what I want. No, God works through the ordinary choices, the little moments. That's why they're so important. Have you lost sight of that? Number two, will I bow and surrender to God and his purposes for my life? Haman wouldn't do it. He had a moment. He had a small window of opportunity right there in verse 13, and he refused to do it. And he will pay. Friends, God is giving you the opportunity this morning to bow your life and surrender to him. To repent of being king of your life, repent of being in charge of your life and saying, God, I'm done living for myself. I want to live for you and you alone. And I accept your gift of salvation through Jesus. Have you done that? Will you do that today? Let's pray together. Lord, this is a very interesting passage on many levels because we see the selfish, egotistical nature of a man. And it's easy to pile on him and say, man, what an incredibly selfish, egotistical guy. How stupid could he be? How heartless could he be? And yet, he was simply a guy who failed to acknowledge that Jesus is king, not him. He wanted to be king. It's very apparent by the treatment that he wanted. He wanted to be seen as king because he was king of his own heart. And he had a minute there at the end of the chapter when even his pagan wife and and friends, though they were not believers in the one true God, knew that the God of Israel was not somebody to mess with. And you're doomed if you try to go up against him. And that's the reality for the world today. To resist Jesus is to condemn oneself to eternity apart from Christ. So would you draw people to yourself today? Would you help those who are your children to see the importance of living moment by moment, day by day, in the ordinary choices of life? 
and surrender to Jesus according to his plan and purposes and agenda, not our own. That's how these events unfolded. They were just an ordinary, natural events that unfolded. And yet through them, you're accomplishing an incredible salvation of your people. And that's how you choose to work through us most of the time. May we not lose sight of that. So that in all, whether in the big or the little, Jesus is praised and exalted. We pray in his name. Amen. You know, the daily circumstances, the daily events that we find ourselves in are often very difficult. They're often very frustrating, very hard. A lot of times they don't make sense. But this song that we're going to close with in reflection reminds us that one day we're going to all get to heaven. That's only a promise for those who believe in Christ and have bowed and surrendered to him. That's not for the whole world. It's offered to all, but it's only those who submit to him as king. We're going to find all the answers to our struggles and heartaches now, and this is what gives us hope. Let's stand together and sing. One day you will bind it.